Hello, hey, so welcome back to Experiment Design. So today uh, we're going to start off uh, by uh, looking at a uh, worked out example of randomized um, block design. So I'm going to uh, start by going through these uh, slides that have been posted here. So let me walk you through that first. Okay, so as the, motiv as the motivating example, I'm going to use the uh, pilot study that I um, described last time on the effect of pre-stressing wood. Okay, so I will uh, first recap what we had there. So we had 15 pieces of wood. Um, pretend we went to Home Depot and we bought uh, five pieces each um, of three different grades of wood. So I've listed them here, um, SPF number one, two, and three. So SPF uh, stands for uh, spruce, pine, and fir. So those are the, those are the three uh, most um, common uh, uh, species um, of wood um, used in British Columbia. Okay, so that's, uh, that's why it gets this um, acronym. Um, so they actually number it such that uh, SPF number one is the most expensive and, and therefore also expected um, to be uh, the strongest. Um, and so uh, SPF number three is the cheapest of the three and also ex expected um, to be the weakest. Okay, so in our small pilot study, um, we are going to randomly assign uh, five different load levels um, to the five pieces uh, from each uh, grade. Okay, so I've labeled that um, from uh, 100 to uh, 900 um, as, uh, this, as the strength um, that at the load level that we're going to pre-stress the piece. And we're going to see after the pre-stress uh, whether, uh, whether and how much um, these different load levels um, affect how strong the piece is when we then uh, test it after a month. Okay, and so in keeping with um, the idea of randomization, um, not only should we randomize the load levels assigned to each uh, to the five pieces within the block. Okay, so recall uh, we know that the the strength varies by grade, so we, we will use that as a blocking uh, variable, and so we're going to randomize the assignment of the five treatments uh, within each block. And we're also going to randomize um, the order in which we test them. And so the way uh, we test and record the uh, response measurements is to load into uh, a bending machine um, at a lumber lab, and we're going to measure um, their strength. Okay, so at the, at the bottom here is a, a YouTube uh, link, so you can see what it uh, looks like. Um, actually, it wouldn't hurt if we take a quick look um, together. Okay, so let me just pull this up in YouTube. Yes, yeah, so you can see I have a lot of tabs open because I've been doing uh, research um, on uh, coronavirus. Okay, so let's pull this over and so you can uh, see how this measurement is actually uh, taken um, at the lab. So this is this is the lumber um, uh, bending test um, and so this is uh, the machine that uh, so there's two supports at the two ends and then in the middle um, is the apparatus that pushes the, the piece up um, as it applies the load and then eventually it's going to snap um, and so that's the uh, response uh, measurement okay that, that we that we record uh, from this experiment and you could also see that you don't need super high-tech computers um, to uh, to run uh, this kind of experiment you see a, a computer from the 2000s uh, uh, sitting there that's that's running this um, machine okay and so you at the end there you saw that the piece uh, snapped so the uh, the strength of the piece was uh, whatever load was being applied right at the moment uh, when it snapped 
Okay, so that's the experiment. So let's talk about it in terms of our experimental uh, design um, terminology. Okay, so we had five different uh, load levels. Um, so there's only just one factor here. So those uh, load levels are the five uh, treatments that we have. Uh, we treat uh, the blocks as uh, uh, the blocking variable is the three different uh, grades of wood that we bought for the experiment. And so we get one replicate per block. And so 15 total response uh, measurements, which are the bending strength measurements uh, from this machine. Um, and so the, the question um, that we want to answer with the data is this one. So does pre-stressing the lumber at these different load levels, okay, uh, does it affect their strength? And well, are there, firstly, are there any differences at all? And are there any differences uh, between specific uh, treatments. Okay, so those are the uh, questions that we're able to answer um, using the model for randomized block design that we talked about in our last uh, video. Okay, so um, I want to emphasize here that we're not interested primarily in the differences between the blocks. Okay, so, so we have three different grades of, of wood um, being used in this experiment. And we already know that the higher grade wood is going to be stronger, okay? And so that's why we use it as a blocking variable. We separate out the effect of uh, the block from the effect of the treatments, okay? And, and we assume in this model that we can uh, add the two effects together. And so by uh, including parameters for the, uh, for the blocks, uh, we can more easily um, detect differences uh, among the different pre-stress load levels, if there are any. Okay, so that's the rationale for, uh, for blocking here. So because it's a fairly small um, data set, uh, we can conveniently uh, lay it out um, in a table uh, like this. So here are the uh, 15 uh, measurements. Um, so on the, on the top, we have the three different uh, grades and then the five different load levels, one, one replicate for each uh, uh, block and uh, treatment uh, combination. Okay, so we have 15 uh, values. Um, and so uh, just to summarize the data, I've also listed um, the uh, averages uh, for each treatment and the averages for each um, block. So in the, uh, in the model uh, setup, then for example, 6475 here, that is y bar one dot, okay? Why is that y bar one dot? Because that is the average of all the units assigned to treatment one, which was a uh, load level 100 units, okay? So this is the average of the three units assigned to uh, treatment one, so y bar one dot. Okay, and similarly down here, so 4729, that's the average of the five units assigned to uh, the uh, to, to the block uh, SPF number three. Okay, so 4729 is Y bar dot one. Okay, it's averaged over the, all the treatments for the first uh, block. Okay, so that's how we can relate these summary statistics um, to uh, the model setup for randomized block designs. And finally over here, uh, 6043 um, is uh, in our notation, that would be Y bar dot dot, right? That's the average of all 15 uh, measurements, averaged over all treatments and block um, combinations. Okay, some other summary statistics that are useful here is, uh, well, we can calculate the sample variance of the 15 uh, strength values. Okay, so that's the sample variance of these 15 numbers. Okay, so that's, that's number is given here. We can also calculate the sample variance of the treatment averages, as well as the sample variance of the block averages. Okay, so those are given here um, below. The next slide simply uh, shows you how you can uh, calculate all these summary statistics um, in R. Um, so the, the data is um, in the lumber, the CSV file, uh, which can be found on the course website. And um, so basically, if you just skim through this uh, slide, you'll see basically to get all of these um, to get, to get all these values, we just run a bunch of uh, T applies so that we group. So in, the, in this first T apply, we're grouping um, by the load level applied and then and that gives us the treatment means. 
And then in the next tapply, we're now grouping by grade. Okay, so those that gives us the block means. All right, and so we can do the same thing uh, for the uh, variances as well. So those are the so these are the three commands down here, and you can verify later that this indeed gives us the uh, summary statistics uh, given on the last slide. Okay, so next uh, let's. Uh, relates these quantities and summary statistics that we calculated um, to the ANOVA table. Okay, so the first one, uh, uh, so, we, so we have several uh, sums of squares um, that we can uh, compute from, uh, from these summary uh, statistics. Okay, so the first one is treatment sum of squares. So the equation for that is um, in this in this block. It's uh, b b times uh, the summation over treatments of the difference um, between treatment means and the overall means. Okay, so this one is related to one of the sample variances on the previous slide. Okay, so we have we have the few different sample variances. So which one is uh, related to the treatment sum of squares? Well, it's easy to remember. It's simply the variance of the treatment averages. Okay, so here, 267775 is related to the treatment sum of squares. How is it re related? So let's go over here. So the treatment uh, sum of squares is b times this, uh, this expression. And so we know that this summation, this summation in here, summation over i, so if we divide that, uh, if we divide that by t minus 1, okay, one less than the number of treatments, that would be the sample variance of the five uh, treatment means. Okay, so one more time, this sum of square, this summation divided by five minus one would be equal to the treatment uh, variance of the treatment uh, mean. So that's this, this number on slide three. Okay, so now we need to calculate this uh, summation. So we need, first we need to clear the denominator. So we need to multiply by t minus one. So that's why we have five minus one here. And then we also need to multiply by b. So there, that's why we also have a uh, times three over here. Okay, so that's how we can recover the treatment sum of squares uh, from the variance of the five uh, treatment means. So that's calculated in this uh, first line. Okay, so we can apply very similar logic uh, to get the block uh, sum of squares. And so it simply just switches the role of i and j and b and t. So here we take the sample variance of the block means. Okay, so that's, that's this quantity divided by three minus one, because there's three blocks. Okay, so to get t times this summation, we need to first clear the de denominator. So we multiply by b minus one. So that's three minus one, and then we multiply by the number of treatments. So that's five. And so together that gives us the block uh, sum of squares. All right, and then finally the total sum of squares, well, is related to the sample variance of the entire data set. Okay, so if we take this summation that it, for the total sum of squares and divide it by n minus one, then that would be the variance of the uh, entire sample. So we need to clear the denominator, so we multiply that sample variance by n minus one, which would be 14 in this case. So we take the variance of the 15 uh, data points, multiply by 14, and that gives us the total sum of squares. All right, so once we have these three sums of squares, um, in the ANOVA table, we can get the uh, residual sum of squares, which we have not calculated directly because that expression is the most cumbersome. Uh, it involves four terms in, inside, uh, inside the square term. So since we have the treatment block and total sum of squares, and we know that the total is equal to uh, adding together the other three uh, sums of squares, treatment block and um, and residual, we can get the residual by subtracting uh, the treatment and block sum of squares from the total, and we get the residual sum of squares. Okay, so to complete the ANOVA table, we just need to uh, count the degrees of freedom. Okay, so uh, according to the ANOVA table we wrote down, um, we have uh, the number of treatments is uh, uh, five, and so the degrees of freedom for treatment, five minus one, so four, and then the blocks, uh, same same idea, b minus one, so that's two, and then the residual as we derived last time, um, 
uh, that's degrees of freedom is t minus 1 times b, b minus 1, so 4 times 2, uh, so that's 8. Okay, so from the sum of squares to the mean square, we simply take each, uh, each sum of squares and divide by the corresponding degrees of freedom. So put in table form, what we have talked about uh, can be summarized uh, like this. Uh, so um, this table just fills in all of the quantities that uh, I already uh, previously uh, described on the last uh, couple of slides. Okay, so we have sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom, and then we get the three uh, mean squares. Okay, and so that's how we complete um, the ANOVA table for a randomized uh, block um, design. Okay, so the last quantity in this table is the uh, F statistic. Okay, so the F statistic uh, from the equations is to take the mean square for treatment and divide that by the mean square for the residual. Okay, so I've done that down here in the last line. So treatment mean square divided by residual mean square, and that gives us the F statistic 5.275. So that's the observed value of the F statistic. So remember that this F statistic is used to test in the presence of blocking, it's used to test the null hypothesis that there are no differences um, between the treatments, which in this uh, specific example means testing uh, for whether there are any differences in the average strength um, across the five different uh, load levels. Okay, so how do we use the F statistic? Well, now that we've computed it, uh, we compare it to the corresponding F distribution um, for testing this hypothesis. So that's the F distribution with degrees of freedom uh, t minus 1 and then the residual degrees of freedom. So this that means looking up the value from an F distribution with the degrees of freedom 4 and 8. And so the, the critical value, so in other words, uh, for example, we're doing an, an alpha 0.05 uh, test. We're looking for the constant C such that 5% uh, of the F, F distribution um, is greater than uh, that uh, C value. And so uh, we can get that in R um, using the QF command, and we find it, it is five, uh, sorry, 3.84. Um, OK, so remember that for ANOVA F tests, we reject when the uh, we reject the null hypothesis when the observed F statistic is large. Okay, because the treatment mean square is going to be large, much larger than the residual uh, mean square when, when there actually is a difference uh, between treatments. Therefore, we, it's a one-tail uh, test. We reject um, for large values, and specifically at the 0.05 level in this case, we reject um, when the F statistic is greater than 3.84. And so in this case, it is. And so we conclude that there are, uh, in fact, differences among the average strengths after uh, applying these different one-month pre-stress uh, pre -stress loading um, levels. Okay, so corresponding to critical value, of course, we can also calculate the p-value. So that is done uh, using pf, and so 1 minus uh, the right tail, and we get a p-value 0 0.0223, which is as expected because we reject uh, at the 0.05 level, so that implies the p-value would be less than uh, 0.05, and we get the same um, conclusion. Okay, so that's how we do the uh, ANOVA test. Now, um, the validity of the test um, depends on certain um, model assumptions. Okay, so just to remind ourselves what they are, so I've listed them here on this slide. Okay, so the assumptions in this model are firstly that the experimental units are all independent, and we assume the responses all follow a normal um, distribution. Now, the specific mean of the normal distribution for each unit is determined uh, by three things, the overall mean, the treatment effect, and also the block effect. Okay, so the responses, they all have, they all have different uh, no normal distributions with different means. Um, the third assumption is, unlike the means, which are determined by the treatment and block combination, the residual variance, so the variance parameter in the normal distribution, sigma squared, we are, we are assuming that that residual variance is the same uh, for all units. So how, how do we uh, assess these assumptions? Well, the independence one is hard to test, and, and so um, that's... Uh, 
that underlies one of the reasons why we uh, do randomization. So by randomizing, we avoid introducing uh, ad additional sources of dependence among units. So it doesn't guarantee independence, but that's an important step. Okay, so we, we so we will not be checking that uh, formally. Now, for assumptions uh, two and three, though, uh, we can uh, use uh, various plots um, to check. Now, um, let's look at some of these uh, plots. In the CRD case, so when we did completely randomized um, designs uh, without blocking, um, I explained that we could uh, we could examine whether the normal and uh, equal variance assumptions are reasonable by looking at box plots. Okay, and so here's the command. I could do the same thing here. I could make uh, box plots uh, for the strengths um, uh, and and make a box plot for each uh, load uh, for each load level. Okay, so so this looks very much like a box the type, kind of box plots that we might make um, in the completely randomized um, design case. Okay, so however these box plots themselves in the randomized block design case. Uh, does not tell the whole story, okay? And so why is that? Okay, so here I have box plots by each uh, treatment group. And the reason is when we look at the uh, equation um, for yij, so the equation for the response in randomized block design, the mean for uh, yij is not just mu plus the treatment effect, it also involves mu plus the treatment effect plus the block effect. Okay, and so that so therefore there's a there's a block effect hidden in uh, these um, uh, strength uh, values. Okay, so therefore um, these uh, these five units um, assigned to uh, load to load level uh, excuse me the three units assigned to load level uh, one hundred do not have the same normal distribution. In fact. They, they are three normal distributions with three different means. Okay, so therefore the box plot itself doesn't tell us uh, does, doesn't tell us the whole story about whether the equal variance assumption is uh, sensible. They would if they all if all the observations had mean had the same mean, but here they do not because of the block effect. So the alternative. So let's introduce another kind of uh, plot, and that is the residual plot. Okay, so the residual, um, again, uh, uh, the, re this is a special case of a linear model. Okay, so uh, here we have fitted, we have fitted uh, mu hat and tau i hat and beta j hat um, as the predicted or fitted value uh, for each observation. So we can check whether, whether the residual, in other words, the difference between yij and its fitted value, uh, whether that reasonably follows um, a normal um, distribution. Okay, and the way to do that um, is uh, using a, what we call a QQ uh, plot. Um, so, so this is the command that generates the QQ plot in here. Okay, so notice here in the in the linear model command, I will I'll show you. The, I'll explain this a little more uh, later. So we have now here uh, the load variable plus the grade uh, variable. So I'll explain that in a moment. But suffice for now that this is what we call a QQ plot, which compares. Um, whether the quantiles of the residuals matches the quantiles of a normal uh, distribution reasonably well. Okay, so this again, this uh, in in detail uh, is explained in um, Stat uh, 331, which is our um, linear models course. So I will not go into uh, too much detail uh, here, uh, though. Of course, uh, um, they are uh, an important uh, component of uh, model checking, both in that course and also. Here. Okay, so suffice to say, we're looking for whether uh, the points roughly follow a uh, 45 uh, degree uh, line. Okay, again, we're looking for a rough, um, just a rough um, assessment here, and and it does look like uh, it re there's a reasonable match, and we shouldn't be too concerned here. Okay, so. Um, that is uh, ANOVA in checking the assumptions of ANOVA. So uh, before we move on uh, from this topic, let's also look at a couple other um, loose ends. 
So the first is to look at an example of a contrast. Okay, so we can also test contrasts in the context of randomized block designs. Um, so the first, uh, so just to illustrate, let's look at this contrast. So let's ask, okay, we know there are differences among the five uh, treatments. So let's just to illustrate, look at uh, difference um, between uh, two specific uh, treatments, let's say 100 to uh, 500. Um, so if I back up for a second, and you go back to the raw data, you, know, you do notice that there is a general uh, decreasing trend in strength, um, uh, depending on the pre-stress level, which makes sense, because the more, the more load you apply in, in the pre-stressing, the more we expect the, the strength of the wood uh, to uh, go down uh, because of damage. Okay, so we see that, see this kind of decreasing pattern. And so let's say, so in this case, we could ask contrast, is there a significant difference um, between load level 100 and 500? So is this difference of uh, about 280 units, is that statistically um, significant? So that can be done using a test of contrast. Okay, so, let's so this slide carries it out um, so, uh, so that's looking at the difference between the treatment effects at uh, 500 versus the treatment effect at 100. Okay, so the uh, so the estimate of that is the difference in the in the two treatment means, and we also need the estimate of sigma squared. So we pull that from the ANOVA table. So remember that sigma squared hat, which is simply the residual mean square. Okay, from there we plug it into the formulas we saw last time to get the standard error of the contrast. Um, and so the T distribution we need is, uh, uh, has eight degrees of freedom, um, T minus one times B minus one. And that from there we get the, uh, uh, critic, the, the critical value um, and also the value needed for the construction of confidence interval is 2.306. So that's the constant we multiply, multiplied on the standard error. Okay, so you see the confidence interval in this case is quite wide. It does not contain zero. Um, and so we conclude there's uh, no significant difference um, between just uh, 100 uh, load and 500 load. Okay, so that's uh, just a quick recap of contrasts in this case. Now, let's go back to the, uh, the final key point here is is to illustrate why does why does blocking help um, in this scenario? So last time we showed that in the sum of square decomposition. So when we didn't have blocks, the total sum of squares decomposed into the treatment plus a residual sum of squares. And we showed mathematically last time that when we have when we have blocking uh, going on, then then the total sum of squares decomposes into three parts. Okay, and so there's treatment, block, and residual. And specifically, the, re the residual from the residual sum of squares from the CRD case gets broken down into the block plus residual in the RBD um, case. And we also noted that mathematically, the treatment sum of squares stays the same. So essentially, the residual sum of squares goes down or has the potential to go down when we introduce blocking because the block sum of squares pulls, pulls away from the residual sum of squares and makes the, the block uh, so this block sum of squares will make this final residual sum of squares uh, smaller. Okay, and so specifically when the blocking variable is strongly associated with our response, uh, then um, that can really help reduce the residual um, in the model. Okay, so is that true in our example? Well, okay, let's, let's back up a few slides again. So you notice here indeed that SPF number three is um, significantly uh, weaker um, than SPF number two, and then that's also uh, weaker than SPF number three. Notice there's actually really large differences among these three grades, okay? So there's an average difference of uh, some over a thousand uh, between each, each grade on average. And so you notice that the difference here, the differences between the grades is actually bigger than the differences between the effect of the loads. Okay, so notice the range of uh, strength uh, due to loads is actually uh, much uh, closer to each other than the differences uh, with the blocking, uh, comparing the three different blocks. 
Okay, so in other words, if we if we did this analysis as a CRD, we would not be able to, to detect the differences between the different uh, loads because those differences would be completely obscured by the differences uh, between the three grades. Okay, and so that's the key point um, that I want to emphasize here. Okay, and so that's what um, that's what blocking um, accomplishes uh, for us here. So yes, in this case, the blocking variable is strongly associated with the response. Okay, and so therefore, it's crucial to be able, blocking here is crucial to be able to draw the correct conclusions uh, from our data. So just to numerically illustrate this point, if we ignored the blocking variable and uh, we analyzed the data as if we simply assigned three pieces at random out of the 15 to each load level then and analyze it as a CRD, then the, we would only have, well, we would only have the treatment sum of squares and the residual. So the residual sum of squares is now, uh, now combines both the block and residual sum of squares together from the uh, RBD case and similarly for the degrees of freedom. So key thing here, notice that the F statistic is now minuscule, okay, it's only 0.4. And that's because this mean square residual, or sigma squared hat, is now very large because we did not account for blocking. So in this case, we would incorrectly, include, incorrectly conclude that there is no uh, difference between the treatments, which is actually simply because we were unable to detect any differences in the treatments uh, without properly uh, blocking. Okay, so that's that's a key takeaway uh, from here. So this just uh, this slide just lays lays out um, the key difference um, between uh, these two ANOVA tables. So uh, the first is the ANOVA table from this last slide, which assumes it's a CRD, and then below is the ANOVA table assuming it is an uh, RBD. Excuse me, there's a typo. This should be RB. Uh, RBD here, randomized block design. Okay, so this shows clearly that the sum of squares, which is about 1.8 million, breaks down into the block sum of squares plus the residual sum of squares in the table below. So you notice blocks, uh, the blocks explain a huge amount of the variability among the response, and so it really brought down the estimate for sigma square, which allows us to draw the correct conclusion. Okay, so um, the last uh, thing here computationally is to show you how to do this um, in R. Okay, so these are the corresponding uh, analysis of variance commands that you can uh, plug into R to compute the two ANOVA tables uh, from the last uh, slide. Okay, so the, the bottom one is familiar to you because it only puts in the factor variable, which is the load. So you've seen this ANOVA uh, command um, before, so that produces the CRD ANOVA table. So in order to add the block uh, variable and to, to, and, and to add this uh, extra line for the block is, uh, is to actually simply just add that into the formula with the plus sign. And so R treats uh, uh, the, the, the grade um, as an additional variable to fit parameters for. And so this top command gives us the ANOVA table uh, with the randomized uh, block design. Okay, so just to uh, end off this uh, section, um, so some, some important takeaways. So blocking is really effective in this example um, because the grade of the wood actually does explain a lot of the variability. And so including the blocking variable enables us to correctly detect uh, that there are significant differences uh, among the treatments. And we already saw numerically that here the grade of the wood um, is, has much more uh, explanatory power on the strength variability compared to the treatments. Okay, and we see that by looking at how big the sum of squares are. Um, so a uh, final thing you might have noticed is in the R output on this slide, you notice there is also a, an F statistic uh, for the blocking variable. That's great. So R also automatic, automatically computed a, an F statistic for that. Okay, so um, so yes, indeed, we can also do F tests for significance of blocks, even though in this case um, we are not primarily interested in the block effect, so we did not um, test that. Um, but there is an important point to be made here, which we will come back uh, after, which we'll come back to um, after we go through a couple more models. 
Okay, so that concludes uh, uh, my ex explanation of these uh, of this uh, slide set. And so now we're ready to um, go back and look at um, our next uh, our next model. Okay, so I'm going to move the camera and then we're going to go back um, to the whiteboard. Now, um, I I did not my laptop is actually behind me, so I was not able to look at uh, whether there were any questions in chat. But I will uh, I will take a look at that and answer any questions that you guys wrote down uh, before I continue. Okay, so I don't see any uh, questions in chat, so let's uh, let's go ahead and start with our next um, our next model. So in fact, this uh, this next model is uh, not really any um, different in one sense um, compared to uh, compared to CRD. Um, but it simply takes um, the CRD model and looks at it uh, from a different um, perspective. Okay, so uh, specifically we want to um, look at uh, how we can analyze um, the CRD uh, model when the treatments are actually composed of a, uh, a combination of two different uh, factors. Okay, so I will uh, title this uh, section as uh, factorial uh, design with two factors. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we're going to simply start with the T treatment uh, completely randomized. Uh, design. Okay, so consider uh, CRD uh, with T treatments. Okay, and um, so let's write down the, the model equation for that. Y and J. Um, okay, so uh, U plus overall mean plus treatment effect uh, plus residual. Okay, so we have uh, T uh, treatment, so I goes from 1 to uh, T, and uh, we have, uh, so no blocks, but we have replicates, um, so J goes from 1 to uh, R uh, replicates. Okay, so um, the case we want to emphasize, uh, focus and emphasize here is we want to look at where the T treatments are actually uh, a combination of uh, two different uh, factors. Okay, so where uh, treatments uh, are a combination of uh, factors uh, A and B. So let's call it factors A and B. So in other words, the, the, the total number of treatments, okay, so if we have uh, T A, uh, T sub A, uh, factor levels uh, for uh, treatment A. So it's so this is the number of levels Okay, so if we have T sub A uh, levels uh, for factor A and T sub B levels for uh, factor B then we know we get the total number of treatments by uh, simply multiplying uh, the two uh, these uh, two uh, numbers um, together. So that gives us the total number of uh, treatments. So this is the number of levels uh, of B. Okay, so when we treat uh, these, uh, so we take these treatments and we uh, use this model to analyze this situation, um, we notice that there is a tau parameter 
uh, for every for every treatment. Okay, so let's let me explain what I mean by that. So let me write here. So the model. Um, okay, so since th this is we have these tau i uh, parameters, so with these tau i's uh, has a has a parameter. So it's tau i. So it has a parameter that helps govern the average for each uh, for each treatment group. Okay, and, and you'll see um, shortly why this is uh, why this is important. Okay, so this includes a a parameter for the mean response. Uh, mean response. Uh, of each combination of A and B. Okay, so specifically, uh, what what we mean is that uh, uh, that mu plus tau i. Remember, this model is the mean of treatment i. Okay, now, um, one special case that we're going to look at now is the fact that these, uh, these treatments are actually two factor levels um, put um, together. Okay, so um, let, let's define a couple of uh, things here. So, uh, so, if the, so, if, so let's make this point first. So if the levels of the two factors So the levels of okay, let's start with factor A uh, have the same effect uh, for each level of B of factor B. Uh, then we say the effects are additive. Okay, so what we mean by additive here is that you can simply take um, the effect of uh, one factor and the effect of another factor, and so if if they if they don't interact, as I will define um, later, then they are uh, they they are additive. You can simply add together the two uh, effects for the two factors, and and you do not, in fact, in this case, need a separate parameter for every single treatment. Okay, so that will, that will uh, make a little more sense as I, as I do a little bit more explaining here. Okay, so let me first, let me just write this point. So when, uh, so when, so okay, so that, that's, that's the definition of additive. So when the effects are additive, Then we need we don't need as many parameters um, in the model. Okay, so how many how many parameters were uh, were in the completely randomized um, design model? Well, we remember we had. Uh, uh, so we parse fewer than, okay, so we had one for mu, and then we have t minus one uh, for uh, each, each treatment um, effect. Um, okay, so together in the CRD case, there were, uh, we needed t um, parameters. Uh, t parameters. For CRD. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at an example of that. So let's uh, uh, let me make a little more space first. 
Okay, so just to, just to make this more concrete, let's take a simple case where let's say we have, um, let's say two, two levels of A and three levels of B. Okay, so let's say we have two factors. The first one has uh, two levels and the second one has three levels. Okay, so I'm gonna make a little table here um, to show you what's going on. So we're gonna look at the, the factors and then uh, see how they correspond to treatments and then uh, see how that compares um, to having additive um, effects. So I'm gonna make this table and then we'll have our uh, musical break. Okay, so factor uh, factors here, so factor A, uh, uh, B, and then let's label the treatment. Um, and then we have here uh, CRD. And then here, uh, we, we're going to write, uh, I'll show you what I mean by additive effects. So there's a question in, in chat that asks uh, one plus t minus one parameters. Yes, so there is uh, one parameter for mu and then there are t tau's because there's t treatments and there's one constraint. Okay, so that's where the t minus one came from. Okay, so let me let me show you how uh, how these, uh, okay, so, the, so CRD additive effects and what I'm gonna be writing down in here is the model mean under these uh, under these two uh, cases. All right, so here's our here's our table. Okay, so there are two, two levels of A and three levels um, of of B, and so um, uh, well, let's list them out. There's six treatments. Okay, so so we know that the six treatments are composed of these uh, two levels of A and three levels of B. Let's write them down. Okay, so I have I can put. Uh, factor A at level one and factor B at level one, and then I can do the same. So, so with level uh, with factor A at level one, I can assign level one, two, and three for uh, B, and then likewise I get the other three treatments by assigning level two to A and then one, two, and three to uh, B. Okay, and so um, that corresponds to the six treatments. So let's just uh, uh, label these six different treatments, one to six. Okay, so in the CRD, uh, what's, the, what's the mean uh, under treatment one? Well, we express it as well mu plus tau one. Okay, and then similarly, we have mu plus tau two and so on, mu plus tau six. Okay, so that's, that's how we learn to represent the means um, uh, of, of each uh, treatment um, under a CRD. Now, if the effects are additive, then I can simply, I can, I can simplify, I, I simply need to make a parameter for uh, the levels of A, and then I need some parameters for the levels of B. Okay, so let me define, um, let me define uh, the parameters. Okay, so we're gonna let, uh, let's see. So let, uh, okay, so, let, so let uh, alpha i um, be the effect of uh, level i of a factor a, and then I'm gonna define uh, lambda j be the effect of level j, let's say, of uh, factor b. Okay, so let's using this notation, we can we can express what would be the uh, uh, what would be the model means uh, 
when we have additive effects. So additive means we can simply add together the effects of these two factors. So for example, uh, with uh, factor A and B at levels uh, one, then we, under the additive model, you would simply do mu plus the effect of level one of factor A, and then plus the effect of uh, factor one of, uh, sorry, uh, level one of factor uh, B. Okay, so likewise, you can fill in the rest of this using the same way. So under the, with additive effects, this would be mu plus uh, uh, alpha one plus lambda two and so on. And the last one here would be uh, mu plus alpha two for the second level of A and the third level um, of B. Okay, so that's, that's the model means. Um, and this, the other thing we should make a note here is constraints. Constraints so that the, the parameters can be interpreted um, in the way we want. Okay, so we're, we learned in the CRD case in this, so that if we sum the six treatment effects, that needs to be zero. Okay, so that's the, we have one constraint um, on, uh, on the towns if we analyze this as a CRD. Now, if we analyze this as an additive model with the, two, with the two factors, then we can infer what the constraints would be. Well, we have two alphas, and so um, not surprisingly, there's a constraint induced, which is that the sum of the alphas is zero, and the sum of the lambdas uh, is uh, zero. Okay, so this, this looks a lot like uh, the RBD uh, constraints. Okay, so now we've we've set up this table. Let's just do a let's do a quick count. Um, so what? So how many how many parameters are we actually um, uh, dealing with? Okay, so uh, we already counted in the CRD case. There are six uh, parameters. Um, there are T parameters, mu, and then and then the six tiles with one constraint. So how many are is there here? So let's let's just fill in here. So the number of parameters here we have. Uh, one for mu, and then we have, uh, well, we have two alphas, but one constraint, so two minus one for the alphas, and three minus one uh, for the betas. So we notice in this, uh, in terms of the number of free uh, parameters, the additive model, as I, as I said earlier, if, if in fact you can simply add together the effects of the two factors making up the treatment, you have to have fewer, fewer parameters because it's just one plus one plus two. So there are four, there are four parameters compared to six parameters um, in the CRD case. That is a, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that shouldn't be a beta, that should be a lambda, thank you. Okay, so um, let's take a little uh, break. Um, so I looked at I looked at your uh, requests, um, and uh, so I'm going to see if I can work my way down. So, uh, so on on top of list is uh, fantasy impromptu and lists by Chopin, and then lists uh, Liebstrom, the love love dream. Um, so both of those are happen to be happen to be pieces I've. I learned a while ago, um, but I just haven't played them very much. And so I was debating whether I can still play them well enough uh, for this purpose. And so I'm gonna give it a try. I've played it uh, a few times today and yesterday just to remind myself. So let's give that a try. So let me move the camera and then I'll do that.
so let's uh, resume. Um, so there's still several requests. Um, I will go through and see which ones I can uh, do um, in the remaining couple classes. Okay, but first we need to uh, finish this model and I'm running a little bit behind today. So I may go over about maybe five, uh, five or 10 minutes. Okay, so um, uh, where were we? Additive, uh, additive effects. Okay, so there's four parameters in the additive effects are additive and six if they are not, in, the, in which case we need uh, six different tile parameters to represent the treatments. Um, and so uh, that is the story uh, so far. Okay, so um, when is there uh, interaction? Well, first, I, let me, uh, so now that I've laid this out, let me um, define interaction. Okay, so if the effects of A and B are not additive, uh, we say they have interaction. Okay, so how can we uh, how can we explain um, interaction in terms of the model uh, parameters? So in terms of okay, so um, okay, I don't have the table on here anymore, but you should have it uh, in your notes. So let me explain uh, how how interaction looks like in terms of uh, the parameters. Um, Okay, so in terms of the parameters, uh, there is no interaction uh, between A and B in the example. Uh, if okay, so if you look at the, the, the table, so so if the effects um, are additive, then it means that. Uh, so if you, if you compare uh, tau 4 and uh, tau 1, so I do, uh, okay, so what, what, is, what is measured by the difference between tau 1 and tau 4? Well, in turn, in, if you look at the table, it's taking, it's keeping factor B fixed and then uh, changing factor A uh, from level 1 um, to level 2. Okay, so, so this is, uh, Okay, so let's, uh, let me write here. So this is going from 1, 1, and this one is a 2, 1, okay? So since uh, the, if the effects are additive, then this difference, so going, going uh, taking factor A and going from 1 to 2, should have the same effect no matter what factor B is, okay? So going from, so that should, should have the same effect um, as going from uh, 1, 2 to 2, 2, which would be represented by the difference uh, tau 2 minus uh, tau 5. Okay, so go again, moving uh, factor A from 1 to 2, keeping B fixed. Okay, if it's, if it's additive, then it, I can, it, it will have the same effect no matter what B is. Okay, so the third equality would be tau 3 minus tau 6, because that measures the difference between 1, 3 going to 2, 3. Okay, so there's so there's something that uh, might look a little bit familiar here is we we have we have double equality here. Okay, so we learned that if something is a contrast, uh, we can do it as a t-test. But in this case, there uh, there is two equalities, and so when there are, when there are multiple equalities that we want to test for simultaneously, 
that should remind us uh, of the ANOVA F-test. Okay, so there will be a version of the F-test that we can use to ask to test this hypothesis uh, whether there is um, interaction. Okay, so this would require uh, an F-test. Okay, because there's are multiple multiple equalities. Okay, so as far as uh, as far as it goes uh, conceptually, then um, the the question, the key new question that we're going to ask in this case, is uh, is there interaction between factors A and B? And so we're going to develop the corresponding um, uh, ANOVA F test uh, for this for this scenario. Okay, so is there interaction between A and B? Okay, so to summarize what we've said so far, so if if uh, not, uh, then we can just use the additive uh, effects model. Okay, so that uh, the additive model would be appropriate. Uh, is appropriate, uh, but if there is. Then we need to use. Then we need to use a separate. Then we need to use a separate uh, treatment parameter uh, for uh, for for each uh, treatment combination. Okay, so that's the uh, then use uh, uh, tau one up to tau t, uh, like in the CRD case, in the CRD t treatment model. Okay, and so um, the the key to, to being able to do this is to rewrite the model we've already worked with, and um, and write and use um, explicit parameters um, that govern the uh, interaction. So therefore, we can then do an ANOVA test directly on the interaction uh, parameters. Okay, so the key new idea. Uh, so we're going to introduce uh, interaction parameters. Okay, so I'm going to use an another Greek letter I haven't used yet, so I'll do gamma ij to denote the interaction parameters uh, that are going to govern how uh, factors A and B interact. Okay, so I'm gonna give you that model and then and then we will wrap it up. Okay, so let me write make some space so I can write down the model. So really this is just rewriting uh, the CRD model but with explicit parameters that govern interaction. We write that uh, with interaction parameters. Okay, so I've introduced enough notation to be able to, be able, uh, to do that. Um, so let's go ahead and, and do that now. Um, okay, so it's going to be y i j k, and I'll explain that. Uh, so why do we need why do we need three subscripts? So now, because we're breaking down the treatments um, into uh, two separate factors, so this is now talking about i is the ith level of factor A, and then j is the jth, uh, jth level of factor B. So if you put i and j together, uh, combining those gives us tells us which uh, which factor combination um, the treatment refers to. And then k is would be this third subscript uh, for the replicate. Okay, so it would look like this in terms of the parameters we already defined. So we have mu. Okay, and then now we're going to take tau i and break it down into uh, the effects of the uh, uh, factor A and then effect of factor uh, 
a P and um, interaction parameter, and then the residual term. Okay, so let me uh, clear up what these uh, are. Okay, so alpha alpha i is the effect, or, or in other words, the or an alternatively called the main effect of a level i of factor a. Okay, so i goes from one to however many factor level uh, a has, so t sub a, and then uh, lambda j. So that'll be main effect of level j of factor b, and then that goes for all the uh, levels of b, um, and then gamma would be the uh, interaction effect uh, between the levels. Okay, so between. Uh, level i, so that's why it's sub double subscripted because interaction means there there is interaction between uh, two specific uh, combinations um, of the factor uh, level. So level i of a and level j uh, of b. Okay, and then r is the number of replicas. Okay, so that's that's what's indexed by the third uh, subscript. So k would go from one to the number of replicates r, and so finally the total sample size. Okay, so in the in the CRD case, the total sample size is simply uh, t times r. And now the only difference is instead of writing the t treatments separately, we, we view t as being uh, t, uh, the number of levels of a times the number of levels of b. So, so the total sample size is t a times t b, which is the number of treatments, and then times the number of replicates uh, for each uh, for each treatment. Okay, so um, let's go back to, so let me just finish by uh, writing, writing down um, the table uh, again. So, all right, so I, 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 need, I do need the entire board, so I have to, I have to remove this um, so I can make uh, room. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm gonna do is uh, take, take the table I had earlier and then I'm gonna add uh, what happens in this uh, interaction model in terms of uh, how the parameters are expressed. Okay, so. Okay, so here we go again. So here's factor A and then B. So one, 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 two, three, two, 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 one, one, two, three. Okay, so again, we're gonna uh, look at what is the model mean. Okay, we're now we're going to compare additive, uh, the additive effects, and then uh, uh, the interaction. Okay, so okay, so we already have this already. So for example, mu plus alpha one plus lambda one, and mu plus alpha two plus lambda three. So if we have an interaction parameter that's saying we now have mu plus alpha one plus lambda one plus the gamma interaction parameter. So it's gamma uh, one one. Okay, and then likewise, so you see you simply just add on, we just add on the interaction parameter that we just uh, defined in the new model. Okay, so uh, for example, down here, we have alpha two, lambda three, 
And in the interaction model, we have an explicit parameter, gamma 2, 3, that governs the interaction uh, between uh, level 2 of A and level 3 uh, of B. Okay, so again, let's uh, count up the parameters. So what are the number of three parameters? So we already did it for the additive model. There were two constraints, and so there are there were four parameters here after considering constraints. Now this one, that looks like there's a lot of parameters. Okay, so there's there's two alphas, there's three lambdas, and then there's six gammas. But there's actually a lot of constraints, and actually we don't actually need to to count uh, explicitly. And the reason is, as I was describing, this interaction model is simply another way of expressing the model with T treatments. Okay, so this has the same number of free parameters as the model with tau 1 to tau 6. Okay, so we already know the answer. There are six free parameters altogether in this, uh, in, in, in this model. Okay, because this is a, a different way, just uh, same as the CRD uh, parameters. Okay, they're, they're just re-expressed in terms of the uh, level effects and the interaction of the parameters. Okay, so therefore, this also means because we already learned there are four free parameters among the alpha and the lambdas, so there are six free parameters in total among everything. So among all the gamma ij's, there are two free parameters, because that's the difference. Uh, in the gamma ij's. Okay, now if you really wanted to write down the constraints, uh, we can uh, do that. So let's uh, so let's finish off by writing the constraints. Okay, so, so summation alpha i one to t sub a. So the effects of uh, level a sum to zero, and then effects of Factor B sum to zero and the J and in order to write the constraints for the interactions you can write it this way so if you sum the uh, no matter which way you sum the gammas they should sum to zero okay so I sum them over I for any J they sum to zero and then if I sum them over J Uh, for any i, uh, those also sum to zero. Okay, so we want to be technical and write down the actual uh, constraints. Uh, that is uh, that is uh, what we what we get. Okay, so there's a let me address the last question in chat, which is why are there six uh, free parameters? Okay, so let me just finish with that. Okay, so remember, so the let me say this again as an important point. So the interaction model is just a different, just another way of writing the CRD model, okay? So if we were expressing uh, a unique uh, mean for each treatment, we could say this is mu plus tau 1, mu plus tau 2, up to mu plus tau 6, okay? So that model had a mu and six taus, and, and this is exactly representing the same thing, except instead of, instead of using tau parameters, we've broken up the six tau parameters into three groups of parameters. The first group is parameters alpha for the main effect of A, the second group is lambda for the main effect of B, and the third group is the uh, interaction of parameters between A and B. But they're really just two ways of expressing the same uh, model. Okay, so therefore both of them have six uh, free parameters. Okay, and so therefore uh, between, between the additive model and the interaction model, there, there are two additional free parameters, and that's why among the six gammas, there's only two free parameters and four constraints. Okay, so that's why you don't need to explicitly uh, count this one. We just remember that this is, uh, this is breaking down the tau 1 to tau 6 into three groups of parameters, and so therefore, in total, there's still the same degrees of freedom. 
Okay, so it's time to, to wrap up uh, today. So uh, we will we will continue um, uh, this this story um, on uh, on Monday. Okay, so you all have enjoyable rest of your day, and we'll see you again back here um, on Monday afternoon.